Now can we please welcome Steve Marifiotti, who's going to talk about this wonderful solar seawater science fiction experiment. It's an absolutely <laughs> wonderful piece of, of technology. And this is going to be seriously interesting. Thank you. Well, I hope so anyway. Um, thank you for having me along. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, I guess today I really wanted to give you a rundown of what Sundrop is as a business, our, our origins, our relationship with Coles and, and how it's sort of developed and, and encourage, I guess, some, and seed some thinking, I guess, of how you can approach Coles um, and some insights to how we develop um, projects as a business. Uh, the business is, uh, has been operating now since uh, January, uh, sorry, June of this year. We've been delivering to Coles our tomatoes, but the vision was really set about six or seven years back as an organisation by an individual, our CEO, uh, Philip Samweber, who's based abroad. Uh, and what you see here is the site up at Port Augusta. That's a photograph of the site inside the site. Um, the business is actually the highest, highest grade greenhouse that exists in the world. Um, but what's more exciting is probably how we've moved away from traditional farming techniques and how we've really developed what is a, a, a sort of low cost production facility with the highest quality products. But, and its origins are the most important part though, because once we understand the problem and how we've solved it, it probably gives you the best insight to why we've taken the tack we've taken. My background, just, um, just so everybody knows too, is I'm a third generation uh, farmer as well. So I come from the Adelaide Hills from Harndorf. Um, so that's my background. My family were in retail and in fruit and vegetable production, uh, distribution. Uh, so I've had lots to do with it. I've been involved with Chiquita and recently in potatoes and now into Sundrop. So uh, I can probably empathise with lots of what you, put, you go through day to day in your businesses. Uh, and the development and the risks that go with, with running businesses. I guess our process is what I really wanted to talk through though today. You don't need to read all our disclaimers. <laughs> so as an overview, I guess what, what started, where the discussion started is our, our founder really understood the idea that we had finite resources in natural water, that fossil fuels were an unsustainable approach to how we farm. Um, we had volatility in pricing in our inputs, much the same way in all the aspects that you have in your businesses. And so how do we go about resolving those issues? How do we go about producing? Um, what are our core values? What do we stand for? It is, and for us, it's about the people, the planet and, and profitability. We must be profitable as an organisation. Our first approach was really to Coles, um, and it came uh, it came about three years ago. Philip um, was on a board with another board member from Coles, had a discussion about the sorts of ideas that they had in this space. The concept was that uh, we wanted to reduce the the reliance on natural resources, and let's let's look at the most cost efficient way of producing and and providing, I guess, sustainable um, supply during the peak periods where outside of, sorry, what are the traditional peak periods. So what we saw is that Coles had a lump of trust tomatoes in this instance, in this facility, um, that were all centralised around three months of the year, but it's the other nine months of the year that Coles were missing out on. So that was the, the opportunity, that was the market opportunity that existed. This is, the, this is the path of how it developed. So in 2008, Sundrop, was, the concept was really initiated at that point. So six, seven years of history there, where, um, and much to Simon's point about rejection, 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 uh, our team saw exactly the same thing. So it's quite common that your concept will seem far out and it does feel like, I was watching the movie The Martian and I thought, geez, that feels like going to work every day, uh, where he's having to science the shit out of uh, Mars, so. <laughs> <laughs> it very, it very much so. <laughs> so in, um, like I say, in 2009 we put inside a, a pilot facility at Port Augusta and Port Augusta most people ask me why did you end up at Port Augusta and it's a good question I asked the same question myself um, what we really looked at was understanding okay what are the market needs those nine months of the year when we needed to produce tomatoes how could we do that what were the right aspects we were looking for so it was about understanding what is the climate we need what's the humidity we need uh, what are the heating and cooling costs that we have as a business so to run a greenhouse a, um, we have to look at those periods, but light is one of the really important points. So 
The light at Port Augusta um, sits far better. It's the sunniest point in the world, actually. So it's a quite a unique feature of Port Augusta. It has low humidity. Um, it has also access to seawater. So it's very rare that you get access to seawater, low humidity and great light levels. Um, that really just doesn't exist. We sit at the top of a gulf at Port Augusta. So the site was selected, but then the theory had to be proved. So we set up a, a 0.2 of a hectare facility there. Um, we still have that facility. We do trials in there constantly as a business. Uh, then from there we went to Coles and we said, well, okay, uh, we need to, if we're going to develop along this path, we need to actually, um, we're going to have to invest a couple of hundred million dollars to, to develop what's, what we're looking at. And so we committed at that point that we would, we would be willing to provide a $200 million facility, but we wanted a larger contract. And so we asked Coles about that directly and we said, well, we need assurances around pricing and we need assurances around uh, tenure of the contract and we need assurances about takeoff volumes. Um, and Coles come to the table in all of those respects. So I think um, what I would encourage there is that your negotiations are probably most hampered by your own perceptions of what you think your customer may not want, may or not want to concede. As I say, ongoing, we've, uh, we've now delivered our first tomatoes in, uh, in 2016. The site looks quite amazing actually. Um, what we really tried to do is strip out the traditional greenhouse methods uh, and some of the inputs in there. And, th and this give you what is a typical greenhouse. Uh, ours runs, so greenhouses are generally using around 14,000 litres a week of diesel uh, in their facilities, um, or they're using gas or they're using wood chips to heat. So heat is one of the, the um, key energy requirements. So we looked at that aspect and we said, well, what can we do to strip that cost out and that variability um, of what is uh, an input there. In doing that, uh, we created the solar field. So the solar field is about capturing heat. It's 23,788 mirrors that focus towards the tower. Um, the tower aggregates the heat. We store that heat with seawater. So we run seawater up to the top of that tower. We have a 37 megawatt boiler, which is half the capacity of what a, a power station would have in it, um, to give you some sort of context. That sits at 117 metres in the sky. Uh, we store that energy and we hold three and a half weeks worth of heat in two very large uh, hot water services at the base. Um, so it doesn't, uh, the, the hot water services don't sound too complicated, but um, they provide our stability and sort of protection around our business. Um, so we've taken those out. We also have taken out the need for fresh water. Um, so we've utilised in that case uh, seawater and we desalinate that too. So our operating costs uh, and we also, another third function is we produce a third of our power needs on site as well. So we've taken out the three largest aspects of cost and the fourth one is, is, um, uh, is humans. So labour is our fourth component that's our largest point. So we consider that as we develop. So the model changes. I won't bore you too much. Some of these, uh, some of these details, these are the the benefits and some of the approach that we took to Coles early in the piece. So we provided what are the key benefits to Coles, what are the key benefits to our organisation, what are the key benefits to our investors too. So we have investors behind our business and, uh, and it's something we aim to do. As I say, that, that's the greenhouse. We have four large um, five hectare greenhouses that are all under glass. Um, a solar field that you can see and that's the solar field I was talking about in the discussions and seawater ponds in the uh, the Flinders Ranges in the background and the uh, St Vincent's Gulf sits on this side, so we're five kilometres away from that. The project is a $200 million investment, as I said, and in theory, from early in the piece, you would have thought that that was a pretty hard ask to get up, um, and, but it was able to be done. And it was able to be done because we were willing to challenge the norm and we were willing to challenge the norm with our contracting partner, Coles, uh, and both parties were, were really keen to see this happen. Ours is a larger scale project, but I don't see why it changes for a, for a very small project as well. Our three core values are people, planet and, the prof and profit, as I've said. Um, now, planet is uh, super important to our business, um, so we add always a sustainability aspect, and we've seen that our consumer in insights are showing us that that is a growth trend. Uh, globally, not only in Australia, and as we ex extend, so we have operations that are based in Portugal, in uh, in the US, in the UK, in the Middle East, 
uh, and Australia as well. And so we see the common thread of that too, that people want to, want to understand and own what is behind a product and a brand. Um, profits are essential, but the people uh, really do make the business happen. So we put a lot of effort and energy into that aspect as well. That's talking about the delayering system that we've done too. So traditionally we found that um, a lot of people will go through an agent or a business will run through an agency to make its way to the market. The real risks in that are you don't, uh, you don't have the clarity of the information that comes back, the feedback mechanisms for your business, and also you're adding and labouring your cost structures as well. So uh, there's nothing that an intermediary can provide that probably you couldn't solve for yourselves as well. These are some of our partners, and so we, we work right across a, a number of sectors, um, so all the way through from finance, uh, banking, through to um, engineering and other aspects as well. It gives you an idea of the sorts of people we've brought to the table for our business that you may need to for your business. That's all. All right, thank you. That was interesting, all those partnerships, wasn't it? That there was a very interesting page of connections around the world there. That was, uh, uh, and, and the idea of creating your own energy. We live in this sort of energy-rich environment, and lots of energy, but the government taxes the heck out of it. He seems to have got around that by creating his own. Very clever. So now we're going to live at the, exactly the same level of technological <laughs> advancement. Yeah, yeah. Crowe, come on down. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Oh, I wish I had gone first, but uh, I suppose the first thing, um, the question when we arrived was, what are we going to do on on Monday? Well, if, like the first thing I'm probably going to do is buy an enormous uh, block of chocolate and flowers and a truckload of toys to try and soften the blow for being away for the last three days. <laughs> but I think maybe the first thing you could possibly do would be to look at what you've got already and make a start there. Um, so what I'm about to tell you about, it, for us, it's, it wasn't an enormous investment. It was just strategic planning and a few changes that we made that's uh, made a big difference to our business. Uh, so I'd like to say thanks for the opportunity to speak today uh, to Simon and Coles uh, on behalf of the, the goals the Coles Graze program. Now there's a, a few over 200 producers in this program at the moment. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here standing in, in front of you guys uh, on behalf of the program but also on behalf of everybody um, because I think the room has, has just got so much ability in here and it's going to be great to see what comes out of it over the next 20 years. And hopefully you'll be able to uh, apply some part of your of my business that, that may be able to help your own. A bit of my background is I manage a farm on behalf of my family, uh, which is situated in the, in the Gabaralong Valley on the Murrumbidgee River. It's 30 k's upstream of Gundagai in New South Wales, southern New South Wales. It's only a couple of hours up the road. Uh, my family has farmed the property for seven generations and uh, over that time we've produced a mix of wool, lambs, cropping enterprises, um, uh, but today we're focused on beef production. It's a pretty simple, simple program. We, uh, we run a self-replacing herd of Black Angus cattle and we aim at taking the offspring through to slaughter weights of 460 to 500 kilos. So still, as I say, it's a very simple project. Uh, my mother and father, who still operate in the business uh, today, they had, they had five children, uh, two boys and three girls. Uh, uh, two boys being myself and my older brother, Andrew. Uh, we, both, we both share a passion for farming. Uh, but when an, an opportunity arose in northern New South Wales, he decided to, to go up and set up shop there and, and open a new frontier for the family. Uh, we run a completely separate businesses and that's what works for us. It's, it's, uh, it, it may quell future problems that might arise in families that, that do operate with your brothers and sisters. Uh, we find that it runs 
uh, really successfully, my decisions don't affect him. His, his, decisions, his decisions don't necessarily affect what I'm doing. Uh, but we have the same strategic plan, and uh, that is to deliver as high quality product as we possibly can. We try and make it a, a consistent supply. Uh, we, we want, we'd like to understand the market and understand the market that you want to sell your product into. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important one. And if possible, we'd like to align ourselves with the processor or retailer. And why would we want to do that? Well, they, they can share a lot of info with you because most of the time they can inform us they can inform us of what the market's going to do, uh, what it is, what it is doing. Um, they have they have enormous teams working on this. They spend millions of dollars doing it, <coughs> and we don't. And I don't have the money to do it. And I don't want people to hang over the fence and tell you, "Oh, this market's going to go. It's it's all, it's already gone." Or it's you know, I've heard this. I've heard that. Talk to your processor. Talk to your retailer. They know exactly what's going on. That's their business. Uh, so work with them and develop your relationships and you'll find uh, that there are really approachable uh, companies out there that are happy to work with you. It works, you, you work well with them, they'll, they'll work really well with you and we've, we've absolutely found this with Coles. So Andrew, my, the older brother as I was talking about, he went on to develop his, his properties in and around uh, Garah, which is in northern New South Wales. I'm not quite sure if anyone knows, it's just below the Queensland border. Uh, he's focused on malt barley and he sells into the, the beer making industry. Um, uh, it's, in his actual fact, he, he, supplies in, he supplies into a company called Barrett Burston Maltings and, and they then on supply that to the Peroni beef brand and uh, he's a sole supplier of that, of that product in Australia. So if you have a, a Peroni, he's, he's the one that does it. Uh, uh, and then, so back in the south, I supply beef into the Coles, into Coles to be sold under their new and emerging graze and beef brand, uh, their, their new emerging graze beef brands. So um, why, did we, why did we decide to do the graze beef brand? Well, the graze beef, graze beef addresses the new want for traceability and quality assurance from the consumer. Uh, we... So when the opportunity came along to be involved with the product from its infancy, uh, we thought it was a great opportunity and we jumped on it. Uh, we'd just finalised a business based in Sydney where we ran a, a paddock to plate structure, uh, providing 40 bistros with product uh, from our farm. Uh, this was not only a confidence building exercise uh, to see people in the bistros enjoying steak that we had put an enormous amount of time and effort into, uh, but also an exercise in reality uh, when trying to find a home for 70% for of the carcass uh, that is not traditionally used on the grill. Uh, so we got on board with a wholesaler, uh, worked with him and learned the ins and outs of the meat trade. Uh, Trying to work this business in Sydney from a paddock near Gundagai uh, was taking its toll on me. Uh, along, with the, along, along with the bite marks from every shark meat dealer between here and Sydney, I figured I had to get back to basics because uh, that's what we're really good at. Uh, but in, in learning that, in the, during that whole process, uh, we knew we had a really good grass-fed product. So when we looked into graze a bit more and found that it was going to be marketed as a premium product, grown under a stringent quality assurance program developed by us, the farmers, uh, we thought it sounded really good. Uh, so we set ourselves a target of supplying year-round. Uh, so we split we split calving from autumn, uh, from a... a, a predominantly spring calving to autumn and spring and in doing so we we spread our cattle uh, across the year by, by, by just doing that. Uh, so how do we do it? We place a huge emphasis on genetics 
uh, in our cattle and then the genetic ability of those cattle. Uh, because in essence, these, these animals have to average a bit over one kilo of day of weight gain uh, for over a period of 12 to 15 months. And doing that on grass is not easy. So miracles, miracles just don't happen in the grass-fed cattle game. And the basis of it is if, if, the, if the cattle don't possess a genetic ability, you might as well forget it and, um, and, and try to do something else or, or just a, make an attempt at making your business a little bit better some, some other way. Uh, we place a huge emphasis on nutrition. Uh, clearly, they can only eat grass, uh, but grass is not just plain old grass. It's... There's, there's some amazing grasses that are available out there at the moment. Uh, some of them have virtually no nutritional value and they may as well be uh, chewing on a, a phone book or something, but <coughs> there's others that, that will outperform like you've never seen before and, and uh, it's, to, it's thanks to the plant breeders that have been able, that have done that over the years, enable us, to enable us to attempt to such a thing as, as year round. Uh, grass-fed beef. So we apply as many of the grass-growing technique, techniques as we possibly can. And we sow, we sow rye grasses, fescues, clovers, uh, basically anything that is green, uh, we'll try and grow it. Uh, we also grow all types of cereals and uh, we add grass mixes to them. Um, we, we see increased weight gains in paddocks by purely giving the animal a choice of different things to eat. You know, th this can be as much as 20% in some paddocks. It's a really simple idea, but you must learn about what the animal likes to eat and not, would, not what you think that they should eat. Uh, before the cereal goes to head, uh, we cut it. We cut it uh, because the, during the program in the quality assurance side of things, you, you, can, you can't graze any cereals that have any grain developing in them. That's, that's obvious, it's just part of being grass-fed. So uh, to counteract this, we cut all the, all the cereals and make them into silage before they develop to that stage and then we feed it back to them when, when, the, when the dry times arise. Uh, just a really simple other thing that we do is we just we track growth rates of our animals individually um, and we just really simply do that by making use of the analyzed tagging system. Now for us, we don't see it as a burden whatsoever of putting tags in the animals. I understand that it probably would in, in, other, in, in other parts of the country, uh, but we enjoy using it because of the, the tools that are now made to adapt to the analyzed tagging system. And it gives us a great ability to uh, store information on these uh, tablets and computer systems by using a, a piece of equipment that you have to buy law anyway. Uh, so make it work for you. And what's next for us? Well, we've built a barley sprouting system uh, where it turns a barley, uh, where, where it turns seed barley into, um, where it takes seed barley, uh, where we place seed barley onto trays and we sprout it into grass. Um, and it can, we've been currently feeding it to cows and calves you know, for increased milk production. Now this is in its infancy, infancy and we'll, we'll keep it there for probably 12 months um, to allow us to gain the data needed to be able to make informed decision on whether it's a viable proposition for us or to continue with it or not. Uh, but it's currently converting one kilo of barley into six kilos of fodder, uh, which is a great increase and it also increases you know, the, uh, the, um, the digestibility of that by probably 50%, in some cases it can be up to 45 to 50%. Uh, we place an importance on cash flow and we can achieve that by a monthly outflow of cattle. That's something you can probably do with your businesses. And cash flow is really important. It'll drive your business and it'll help you to fund your own initiative products, your, your in, in innovative projects. It has great effect on your personal mindset. It helps you, helps you to stay positive and it will have a snowball effect on your production and it will grow you a sustainable future to hand on to your next generation. Thank you.
I think earlier today we talked about the difference between supply chains and supply networks, and, uh, and Michael talked about it as part of a supply chain, but I, I was listening to it as a network. He was really developing a connection across and around a circle of influence there that was a really interesting. And his whole, every aspect of his business is really thought through. Very impressive, Michael. Well done. Okay, um, now we'll, he talked about sprouting barley and now we're going to have Sprout X. Um, so we're going to welcome Sam, Tref Sam Trefew. If you haven't heard of Sam, you haven't been paying attention. He's, he's been around. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, just give me two seconds. A tad dry. All right, so today I want to talk uh, about SproutX. I want to introduce that to you, but I, uh, I suppose I've not been brought here to pitch SproutX to you or convert or sell it to you. Uh, I also wanted to bring up some, some other issues that I think we have uh, in Australian agriculture as we start to think about innovation uh, and alike. Um, and so those, those three things uh, would be made up there. So I want to talk about commercialising. Um, and it hasn't actually really been mentioned a lot so far, which is a great surprise because we can talk about innovation and research and development and much as we want. Uh, and having uh, been, a, I'm a farmer myself, we've still got the family farm, I've, I've worked on a number of major commodity groups across Australia. Unless that research and innovation is commercialised and put into a farm uh, situation or any business across any industry where it actually generates a return, now we're talking. Uh, and I suppose that's what I wanted to focus focus on today with most of my presentation. Also want to talk about froth. There's a lot of froth in the ag tech market. Drones uh, I'm going to bring up a bit later. Um, we haven't quite found a way of make, getting them to make money yet. Um, that yet $1.2 billion has been invested uh, and also disruption and, and I'll refer to um, Sundrop on that but I'll go easy on you Steve. Um, I also wanted to uh, uh, just make one point. Um, I think a lot of people in business forget something that's very very simple uh, and that would be around um, you know, that income must exceed expenses, right? And it's pretty, really basic, but we know there's a, a lot of people in our industry and across any, any sector that struggles with that very simple idea. And, and if you can take anything away from my presentation today, um, it would be something along the lines of um, that free markets essentially reward efficiency. That's exactly what they do. We're a free market. We're trading with free markets. Uh, we've got all these free trade agreements. At their very nature, they reward efficiency. That's exactly what they do. And so the more efficient you become in your business, the more you'll be rewarded. And, and I suppose if that's anything you can take away, I'd love for you to, to think about that when you start building some things around your business. Uh, so commercialisation, um, it's, it's a bit of an issue in Australia. We don't seem to commercialise particularly well. Um, we have a competitive advantage in Australian agriculture. We're all very well aware of that. Um, am I in the way, guys? Can you see okay? Cool. Um, so we've got obviously got a huge talent pool and, and that's evidenced by, by what's standing in front of me today. An amazing knowledge base, we know that, uh, and a real cultural passion. And, and I actually work now for a financial services business which is behind SproutX and I'm much regularly uh, spoken about how much passion people from finance see in ag and of course we're all so used to it, um, but it really stands out. Uh, but we're not commercialising that well and it's really hard to find a metric to, to quantify commercialisation. One, can, one part of that I would say would be uh, the way we look at patents. It's not a silver bullet but it's just a suggestion and I think these figures speak for themselves. 2014, USA 330 million people, uh, New Zealand only 4 million people and Australia we've got 23 odd million. Uh, so that says for every uh, 2,000 people in the US there's one domestic patent registered in the US. A similar figure in New Zealand, Canada and the UK were about the same. In Australia, it's one patent per 20,000 people as registered in 2014. So, so it's again not a silver bullet on quantifying commercialisation, but we're, we're having a few issues here. It's also represented by the amount of uh, venture capital activity, and I'm just going to bring up uh, ag tech here. So 4.8 million went into ag tech last year in Australia, um, and 2.2 billion into the USA. Um, uh, I would also say a lot of that 4.8 would have been Bosch's contribution into the yield, which is a sensor tech ag startup from Tassie, um, and uh, they've put three and a half mil uh, into that over the last couple of years. So again, per capita, Israel, $68 per person in Israel is put into ag tech venture capital. Uh, USA, $6.88, Canada, $5.03, UK is about $1.90, and we're sitting at 21 cents. Um, so we, we do have an issue. So the crunch. Um, the lim limited support for our entrepreneurs and our startups, we know this, we're one of the last developed nations to develop a, an active ag tech ecosystem to, su to support um, the commercialisation of innovation. Uh, we also have fairly poor access to capital. Now I always think that capital will always find a good investment. 
Uh, there's billions of dollars trying to get into the sector right now. Um, they, they will fish out the good investments, um, but of course, compared to the US, our access to VC uh, funds is a little bit light on. We don't have any su support networks like I've just mentioned. Uh, and, and old Will Patterson here, he's a mate, um, he's uh, from a farm out near Bendigo, uh, came up with a bit of an ag tech startup, had no uh, access to capital or, or no way that he could um, build his business, uh, so he just went to the US. 20 grand, gave up 6% of his business, had 30,000 customers in the first three months, um, smashed it, and, and we, lost, we lost that IP, we've lost that knowledge. Um, fortunately for us, and unfortunately for Will, he had to come home due to personal circumstances, um, but you know, there's many, many Will Pattersons out there. So the opportunity is, uh, we've learnt from the US, we've learnt from Israel, um, and we need to develop an ag tech ecosystem. Um, we need something to really, I suppose, start driving some commercialisation in our, in our innovators. Uh, and I suppose this is what we need for startups, and I suppose this is what SproutX, this is what I've been working incredibly hard on with a number of other people in the team to, to build for Australian agriculture. So government support, that's government funding um, uh, and whatnot. Distribution, not much point having an awesome product if you can't get it in front of customers. Um, Rural Co are coming on board as a supporter uh, and a foundational partner, 500 locations around Australia, uh, and they actively want to distribute our startups, um, goods and services. Technology partners, Bosch, biggest sensor manufacturer in the world, 27 uh, Bosch sensors are in your average car, no matter what make or model, about 120 in your tractor and upwards of 250 plus in a combine harvester. And there's about five in these, you know, the little thing that makes your portrait landscape thing, that's a Bosch sensor. So they've got stuff in everything. Um, they have a lot of solutions, but they don't know what their problems are in ag, so they're coming into SproutX to find out how they can enable that space. Uh, mentors, we're trying to do what we can to get the best and brightest, a lot from overseas, and of course domestically where we can. Investors, um, we've actually just set up, setting up a, an ESV CLP, which is a, a, a basically a, a fund for ag tech. It's the first one in Australia. They, they operate quite well in the US and, and Europe. So it's a $10 million fund that we're setting up that's purely sitting there to provide fuel and, and, and fuel uh, early stage startups in the SproutX program. We need to get these guys uh, getting access to, to smart money. Um, uh, exposure, we've got agreements with Fairfax Weekly Times giving our startups credits to get their stuff out in the market and a co-working space. Um, co-working space, we have a great uh, location in, um, in Melbourne. Uh, this is not about getting everyone into, into the cities though, we're doing regional hubs uh, as we grow. Uh, but, you know, we've heard about Uber and Airbnb a lot already. Um, they didn't come out of an accelerator, but they came out of a co-working space. They came out of a face-to-face -face interaction where great things happen. You know, one guy said, I'm pissed off, I'm so sick of paying, ca you know, cash to cabbies. And one's like, I don't even like catching cabs, you know. So they created Uber and it, and it came through and that was the result of like minds sitting in the same room. So we want to start to, to create that. It also protects... I think uh, entrepreneurs from the tall poppy syndrome that we have in Australia, which is really, really stifling and, and don't get me started driving into the cultural drivers as to our, our current state of startups. So, um, so essentially that's what Sprout X is setting out to achieve. Um, it's a joint venture between the National Farmers Federation, Findex uh, and Findex. Findex is the, the largest privately owned financial services company in Australia. Uh, you may be familiar with their brands, Crow Horth, the tax and accounting uh, firm, 110 locations around Australia and New Zealand. So they're pretty actively involved in agriculture and are the largest uh, professional services provider to ag. Um, so I'm just going to touch on a couple of the programs. I want to keep the pace up here if you don't mind because I've got a few little things I want to cover off on. So we've got four programs essentially. Um, there's the pre-accelerator program which we launched on Friday. Applications are open, six weeks online with an hourly mentoring session with a, with a really great mentor, Skype, no matter where you are, uh, for very early stage, um, early stage uh, ideas. Uh, then you go into the, the actual SproutX uh, accelerator. So very much a, a, your atypical uh, six month accelerator. Five weeks you can spend in the regions. If, if you're based in Dubbo, Wagga, Esperance, I don't care, wherever you are, you can get access to, to SproutX. Uh, and then you, you would ideally come into that co-working space for, for all the reasons that we've just discussed. Um, so basically how it works is a board recommendation um, on the startup. So this is what you need to do. You need to focus on this. Your proof of concept's not good enough. You need to do better market validation. Um, your, your financial forecasting, your modelling's not good enough, da 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 uh, they get their funding, they then come into the accelerator, which is your classic Silicon Valley team, technology and traction, and that's how you're assessed. Most people will usually have a great tech and great traction, but their team's not good enough. Uh, and it pains me to say, but it might be run by uh, someone who was 
you know, is a farmer or is a scientist and they're not necessarily a commercially minded entrepreneurial person who, who is well equipped and experienced in dealing with venture capital and those kinds of really high level commercial discussions. So that's a, a lot of what I do is I'm, I'm dealing with people that are coming in thinking that they've got all the answers but we've got to start back at the team and start looking at who's driving this. Uh, and then, of course, they'd get to pitch to investors. Um, and we've got a number of venture capital firms from all around the world wanting access to deal flow uh, in Australia, and, and so we're providing them with that. The second piece, um, or the third, I'll, I'll just, I won't touch on the, the third one. The fourth and major part of what we're doing, and I suppose this is a focus on commercialisation, is the corporate accelerator. So there's one, at $1.4 billion is spent um, uh, on agricultural R&D every year. Uh, and from an ROI, uh, personally, I'm going to say it, uh, and if we know we're here to have some sticky conversations around innovation and some of the real challenges, having been brought up on the farm, I don't see it. I don't see the ROI on that on all those funds um, coming from a very commercial background. I need to see that money, um, you know, at least break even every year. It'd be good on on, on productivity gains. That's fine. Sproutx is out there to help uh, RDCs and, and other organisations commercialise their technology. We've just signed a deal with MLA. They've got 45 very real industry problems that they want to put to our community and ask for technology and teams to come up with solutions to very real industry problems. And, and a few of the other RDCs are keen to have a conversation as well. So this is represented very quickly here. So that might be I've got some cool startups working there at the moment. A couple of them are Israelis. I don't know what is in the water in Israel if you ever go there, but um, you've got to drink it because these guys are just insane what they're coming out with. One guy's lower. Uh, he's actually reduced bruising in Pink Lady Apples on farm by 40%. Did it in six weeks, and he's already signed up the largest asparagus grower in Australia and a number of farmers in the Golden Valley region. He's heading into Tassie. He's only been here for about six months. So awesome, awesome stuff. So he's a guy with, with, a, with a, a team and an idea with some traction. He comes into the public accelerator. Uh, we give him 50k, uh, we take 8% of his business and he goes into the accelerator program. This is more for the corporate innovation program, so you might even apply to us and say, hey, I love red meat industry, what are some of the problems? I think I've got some technology, I'm an entrepreneur, I want to help out, I want to be involved. You come into the corporate accelerator program, we match you up with whatever else that you need. We take a bigger equity stake, we give you the cash and we put you through the accelerator. So that's the corporate, uh, corporate accelerator program model. Um, I'm nearly finished. I'm just going to wrap up now. So the second part piece of what I want to talk to you about was froth. I call it froth. There's a lot of froth in the ag tech market. Like I said, 1.2 billion has gone into drones. Uh, and I wasn't surprised to hear yesterday that what was it, 15% of farmers um, aren't going to, you know, was it, you know, I suppose autonomous tractors and drones that they didn't, you know, have a lot of hope in it or they wouldn't bring them onto their farm. That's because they're not deriving a commercial, a commercial outcome yet. We don't have a subsidised agricultural economy here, as you know. We don't spend money on stuff that doesn't create an on-farm efficiency generally in Australia. And, and that's, the say, that's the case here. So this is me in Guangzhou at the Canton Trade Fair. Um, with a, you know, everyone was raving on about drones. It's a three metre wide boom spraying drone. You guys know enough about agriculture for me to run through these numbers. Three metres, let's, you know, she holds seven and a half litres. You know where I'm going with this. Seven and a half litres, three metres wide. Let's fly it at 20 kilometres an hour. She's covering six, to, six hectares an hour. I worked out that's three minutes you can spray for, then you've got to bring it back in, fill her up, out you go again. You can only do that two and a half times before it shits itself in the paddock and dies because the battery life at full load capacity only lasts about 25 minutes. So we've got a few issues, but people are throwing money at it, it's crazy. So I have no doubt they'll be a part of the solution one day. A lot of other technologies have got to start catching up. Irrigators have got to start talking to them so they can do section control, sprayers. It'll all happen, but right now it's, I would call it a very frothy part of the ag tech market. So the adoption, especially in places like Australia, is very slow, but they are cool toys. Uh, and my last piece is around disruption, and I think there's been a... Some really great conversations here around you know, farming better and farming more efficiently and focusing on what we do best. And there's a lot of cab licences and cab drivers out there that thought they were getting people from A to B really, really safely. And there's a lot of hoteliers out there that thought they were doing a cracking job of supplying hotels to people all around the world and they got disrupted big time. Big, big time. And I'm, I'm going to use Steve's little example here is, you know, they're going to take up 12% of, of, of supply into Coles Tomato, Trust, Trust Tomatoes. An old mate here has been doing a great job for however long with his tomatoes, um, but he's, he wasn't looking sideways. Uh, and if he was, what would he have done? Would he have pivoted? I don't know. But my, my suggestion is, is sun drops uh, is just the start. Uh, and, and there's going to be lots of other sun drops and other different verticals and other different parts of our sector that is going to pop up and disrupt our industry. Uh, and it's how ready we are for that. Because this guy, I can tell you, wasn't expecting Sundrop to come along. I think Sundrop's an awesome initiative. I'm incredibly excited about it. But as a perfect example, there, there's a disruption piece. So anyway, that was a fairly quick. Um, oh, thanks, mate. 
But uh, yeah, fairly quick rundown. Happy to ask questions. I'm around tonight and we're going to jump on the panel now. So thank you. Okay, 